thanks to the organizers um, for this interesting meeting. It's really a pleasure to be here. So um, I should have had the word memory in here, so it should be strong error correcting codes and exponential memory capacity in neural representations. Um, you know, the question came up yesterday, what is it that um, brains do that um, might offer a promise uh, for improving upon conventional computing, right? And you know, can we build exascale computers? Can we, can we do some of these things? So, I don't know. I don't know the answer to these questions, and I, obviously none of us do really in this room, but I hope that today I can provide you a couple of interesting examples, um, uh, one directly from the brain, one inspired by the brain, of computing that really is qualitatively different from um, the kinds of computing that we normally think about in, um, in conventional computers. Okay, so um, just like Penty made the case for you yesterday, um, I want to make a few observations uh, about neural representation. It's high dimensional, um, it's very distributed, it's parallel, and um, it's implemented by dynamical systems um, uh, involving elements that are each relatively um, uh, short-lived or memoryless in their responses, in their individual dynamics. And what I want to um, show you is that uh, these properties can lead to really qualitatively new and interesting capabilities. Okay, so let me start with directly with an example um, from the brain, okay, and um, some of you may have heard of grid cells, so I'm going to talk about the grid cell code and how it enables a qualitatively different kind of uh, representation than we have previously known about from other measured codes for variables in the sensory and motor peripheries, all right? So um, let me try to unpack that. So here's a picture of the response of a single cell, um, a single grid cell. So what you see over here, um, what you see over here are um, a, a black line, which is the trajectory of an animal as it's running around in a box in a flat 2D plane. Um, and the box is just about a meter um, per side. And the black is the trajectory of the animal. And each red dot here represents a spike emitted by a single neuron, right? So this is all of these spikes are from just a single neuron. And what you can see is that um, these spikes are sort of happening all over the place, unlike place cells, which most of you probably have heard about, um, which tend to fire at just sort of one uh, neighborhood of a location in space, this grid cell, this particular cell, is firing in multiple locations. But also, you should be able to see that the density of firing isn't uniform over this whole enclosure. In fact, the firing has these fields, these discrete blobs, and the blobs themselves are arranged in this nice periodic pattern, this nice equilateral triangular lattice pattern. Okay, so this is a cell in layer two, three of the entorhinal cortex. Um, it was discovered in rats, but um, it's, there's evidence since then that um, it exists in bats, in mice, and um, there's also some evidence that it probably, these cells exist in humans. So probably this is a general mammalian um, system uh, for, for and, and the firing of the cell is clearly related to some encoding of space. Okay, so this is one cell. All right, and so if we want to sort of um, formalize what it is that the cell is doing, let's just consider one dimensional uh, mathematical statement about what, what, what these cells are doing. So I showed you one cell. So one cell is coding, has this nice triangular lattice. If you look at a cell next to it, a neighboring cell, right? So we just go back here. The neighboring cell um, uh, to this cell has also the same triangular lattice pattern, the same spatial period the distance between the blobs. It also has the same lattice orientation, which is the orientation of these two primary lattice vectors. Um, the only difference between neighboring cells, really, um, that are grid cells, uh, appears to be like a shift in the 2D phase, so uh, just a 2D translation. So in other words, these different cells are together um, uh, encoding location in the same way, in this periodic way, but their different responses are just phase shifts of one another. Okay, so in 1D, um, in blue, you can think those here is I've just uh, uh, plotted one cell's periodic response. Purple is another cell, and um, pink is, is a third cell, right? And so um, if you know that this cell is firing um, a lot, then you know something about position. In fact, you know that uh, the animal is at some position x such that x mod lambda, which is the period of this periodic response, divided by lambda is, say, one quarter, which is the phase of this cell. And if you knew that the purple cell was firing, you'd know location is a phase again. But the, there's no information in this response about where the animal is um, uh, across periods uh, because the response repeats itself. The whole population of cells with the same period, the response repeats. So all you have information about is location modulo the period. Okay, so that's the coding of position in this whole population of um, grid cells. So it turns out that there's actually not just one population of grid cells, there are actually a few different populations of grid cells. So as you go along this cortical region, um, along one axis, this dorsal ventral boundary, um, there are groups of cells that have a given period, and as you systematically move up to the ventral end of the boundary, the, there's a systematic 
change, or at least there's uh, different groups of cells have different um, periods. In fact, these uh, changes in period are, are discrete, so there are just a few discrete different periods um, in the representations. And the periods all fall in some, you know, one decade, very narrow range. So about a third of a meter is the smallest period, and the biggest period um, is actually less than three meters. So, you know, this is only one decade in scale, all right? And um, uh, for reference, the kinds of distances that an animal travels over the course of the day, these rats travel um, 100 meters to one kilometer per linear dimension per day in search of food, and so that's kind of the behavioral distance scale over which they would want to encode and decode um, their estimates of position. Okay, so, so clearly even the biggest period is much, much smaller than the scales that we're talking about here. Okay, so what is the code then for position? So because there are dis distinct periods, um, um, the position variable x is represented in one group of uh, neurons with the, with the given period lambda 1 as this phase, x mod lambda 1 over lambda 1, but then uh, there's a separate phase with respect to the second period lambda 2 and so on up to the, the, the nth period lambda n. And um, there are order 10 different um, periods in a given animal, okay? So, so n is order 10. So this is what I like to call a population of population codes. Each population codes one phase, and then there's a, a set of populations that encode these different phase variables. Okay, so this seems really bizarre, right? I mean, you've got this position variable, which is, you know, two scalar quantities, local scalar numbers, and they're being encoded by these periodic functions um, and uh, very non-local and completely periodic. So why would you want to encode um, position that way? So it turns out that, um, so, so th this kind of representation Rep rep representing a number x by um, its moduli, okay, modular phases, um, has a name. If x is an integer and lambda is an integer, and we get rid of the dividing by lambdas, um, this is actually a number system. It's called a residue number system in computer science. And um, residue number systems are very interesting systems. So um, they have some interesting properties. So we're used to fixed-based number systems. Um, so if I want to represent um, numbers using our conventional decimal system, you know, you have these registers, and if you have five registers, um, six registers, you can represent a number as big as 10 to the 6. Um, and, um, you know, so, uh, so, so you can do that. Um, but if you use a modulo system, you can also represent a number as big as a million, but you could just use these three different um, periods or moduli. Um, or you could alternatively um, use um, six different moduli, but now the, there's a big difference, which is that um, here the moduli span many, many um, orders of magnitude and scale. Okay, but here the moduli are all about the same size. Okay, which is, from a biological point of view, this is very interesting because, um, as we all know, it's very tough to construct things that span many orders of magnitude um, in dynamic range or in size. It's, there's a parameter that would need to be tuned to cover six orders of magnitude to get these different periods. Here you can get away with all periods that are roughly the same. Okay, and you get something similar. So, so first of all, the network parameters don't need to uh, span several orders of magnitude, and you require only a small dynamic range. Okay, it's also very um, interesting for another reason. So um, we heard from Penty about holographic or distributed representations where each sort of piece of the representation carries the same weight as the other pieces. So now, um, in, if I want to represent the number 45, um, Using a decimal representation, this is it, 800,000, this is it, 800,001, 800, and this is it. And, you know, as I move by one unit, all the, other, um, all the other registers stay unchanged, but only the one unit register changes, right? And so, in fact, as I move through by, you know, a unit at a time, this is the only um, residue or the register that changes, and only when I change by tens or hundreds or thousands or ten thousands do the other registers change. It's a very non-whitened, non-equal, non-holographic representation in that sense. By contrast, in the modulo representation, if you have roughly equal size moduli, um, a, you know, a shift from 800,000 to 800,001 involves changes in all of these moduli. They're all kind of doing the same thing. It's a very distributed and whitened um, representation. Okay, and also, um, d you know, damaging, if you, if you, if you destroy the unit here, um, uh, uh, the information in, in one of these registers here, you destroy information on a specific scale. Here, if you destroy one of the units, you destroy information on all scales equally. Okay, and so, um, so, so it's, it's whitened in that sense. Okay, um, another interesting property about this um, uh, modulo um, system, and by the way, it's not only a system for representing um, integers, so in the residue number systems are for integers. This is a generalization um, to representing even reals, right? A modulo operation is well defined for real numbers um, um, as well. Okay, so the other thing that's very interesting about modular arithmetic, we, we talked uh, yesterday about uh, actually uh, the, the, the time complexity of addition, 
Um, in this system, the time complexity of addition, so in decimal, um, you know, if you want to do addition or in any fixed base number system, you have to first do the smallest register, add up, look for any carryover, go on, and so on. So the time complexity in a naive system is n. In a more sophisticated system, it's like log n. Um, it turns out that addition in modulo systems is completely parallel. So 2 plus 4 modulo 5 is 1, and so you just write that down, and even though there was a wrap around, you don't actually have to carry information over. So you can verify that um, the sum of 97 plus 4 written in modulo system is just um, 351 over here without any carries. Okay, so you need, uh, it's completely parallel non serial updating across moduli, so there's a speed up here. The, 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 the time complexity of computing that sum does not depend on the size of the sums that are being computed. Okay, and um, from a biological perspective, there's an advantage because you don't have to build wiring that pushes information from one of the registers to the other. Okay, so uh, from a neuromorphic or a biological perspective, that's also an advantage. Um, so so, so, so that's, um, that's an interesting property um, as well. And the reason why um, uh, arithmetic is an important thing to do in this grid cell representation is um, this system is representing position. Okay, and to represent an updated position as the animal moves some display, has a displacement, moves by some delta x, um, you need to now update the position estimate by adding the displacement to the representation and then arrive at the new representation, right? So the system is constantly doing um, these addition operations. Okay, there's another very interesting property of the system. Um, so this, this system, is, this coding, this coding into these modulo residues is, um, it's not structure preserving or metric preserving in the following sense. So if you have two numbers, X and Y, that you are um, um, uh, uh, representing, uh, if, if there are two numbers, X and Y, and they have a certain distance between them, so two positions or two locations of the animal is a certain distance between them, it's not the case that the distance in the code words, so C of X is the modular representation, this vector code for X, um, the distance between these um, is not equal to the distance between these. In fact, th the fact that it's not equal is going to be very important for what I'll tell you about the error correction properties. Okay, so it turns out that it's a very um, interleaving representation. It doesn't preserve metrics in this sense, but it is very crucially structure preserving in the following sense. So the more important property is that if you have a representation, the, the, the representation for x plus the representation for y equals the representation for x plus y. Okay, so it's metric preserving that sense. So um, it's not like uh, it's not like um, uh, code words like I'm going to call you know uh, uh, I'm going to assign a code word Alice. Uh, or, you know, um, and to X and a uh, code word Bob to Y, those are not sort of representations that you can add. There's no sort of metric structure inherent to them. Okay, so there's some interesting algebraic properties that the system has. Okay, so um, what, what, what are the properties of this modular representation? Well, it is a number system. Um, you use um, log as many um, um, uh, moduli to represent, you know, large uh, ranges. And so just like um, uh, uh, fixed base number systems, you can encode exponentially large ranges using log of that number of, um, of, of registers, if you will. So here, um, you know, so the phases are all zero and one quantities. They go between zero and one, and they're n of them. So the space, the coding space is this n-dimensional torus. And if you start the coding line, say you identify the zero phase as for the position zero, and then you start moving your position variable x along some range, uh, you start wrapping the, the vector is a point here, the phase vector is a point here in this coding space, and you start wrapping around the coding space. Okay, and as x starts to increase, um, by the time x has moved by, say, lambda 1, the smallest period, then the coding line has wrapped around the torus in one of the dimensions completely, but not quite in the other because these are not um, the same period, so it's not quite wrapped around, so it's just going to keep going. It doesn't close on itself, and um, it keeps going and going and wrapping around, okay? So at the point when, you know, if this line has a finite thickness, you can ask, how long is this line before um, the space is filled by this finite width coding line? And this is the, the range that can be uniquely represented um, of positions. And all these calculations can be done in the reals. And so it turns out that the range that can be represented scales like um, uh, lambda in the front, which sets the scale, which is the period of uh, the individual uh, grid responses, grid cell responses, and that sort of sets a scale, and since all the periods are about the same, I'm just going to give them a name, lambda, um, but notice, importantly, that n, which is the number of distinct periods, is up in the exponent, right? So it's possible to represent exponentially many um, um, positions uh, uniquely using only linearly many um, different periods. 
Okay, so now um, it, it's, it's, it's a funny thing because, um, okay, so, so what's, what's also interesting is that now if we reduce, so this is, this is, the, this is how things behave when you scale the whole range by, um, uh, I, I, if, if, you, if you wait until the whole space is filled with um, this coding line, uh, but uh, it turns out that if you, if you stop short of that, right, if you stop, say, here where there's a lot of gray space still, so the coding line hasn't filled all of space, um, then you can see that there's really some, uh, gaps here between the coding lines. And it turns out that um, if you encode and decode information over some reduced version of the range, so instead of going all the way up to e to the beta n, where beta is some constant close to one, um, you instead encode over some range, some limited range, which is e to the rho beta n, where rho is an additional constant, which is smaller than one, okay? Now you have this empty space between the different segments of the coding line, and it's possible to um, also do um, error correction on the system, right? So any small perturbations of the, of the, of the word um, just map into the space here, which is this gray, gray space, and as long as your perturbations are smaller than half the separation between these lines, it's possible to decode um, uh, the, the position and, and, and back at, um, um, at, at a good estimate, denoise estimate of position. So this is a code where if you're uh, restricting the coding range to some subspace of the full um, coding space, okay, where rho is this constant that uh, tells you how much smaller than the full capacity you're using, then the information rate of this code scales like about log of this restricted range over log of the full range, and that's rho. <laughs> Okay, so you can dial in your information rate, and for that information rate, um, um, it's possible to achieve this exponential capacity uh, in N. All right, and it turns out that if we look at the, um, in the presence of noise, uh, if we use the same number of neurons using more conventional neural codes, then this is the uh, decoded posterior estimate of positions, looks like this green curve here, but with the grid cell code using the same number of neurons and the same noise per neuron, you can now achieve posterior distributions that are much narrower. Okay, so, um, and, and so, so this is an a interesting property of this code, right? So um, now the thing that makes error correction possible is, um, is the fact that as this coding line, right, so uh, this is this n-dimensional torus, which I've drawn only as a two-dimensional torus, but as x is increased, uh, we talked about how this coding line continues to wrap around until at some point it covers all space. And I said, uh, what you can do is instead of going through that whole range of x's, these positions here and stopping here when all space is covered, we're gonna stop short and just short and stop here. Okay, so uh, what a property of this code that makes error correction possible is that these additional coding lines that would have been added if we'd kept going would have interleaved with all of these existing coding lines and fill space, okay? But by decimating the range that I'm interested in coding, um, very conveniently, the portions of the coding space are decimated interleaving with the existing coding lines, okay? It could have been that I had wrapped around the torus in a way where all the lines were closely packed locally here, and then when I decimated the coding line, there was all this empty space over there, right? That would not have led to um, noise tolerance and error correction, right? So it's this very nice interleaving property of the coding line as you continue increasing the range x that allows this error correction to happen. So in a sense, this is a generalization of sort of well-packed sphere codes to, for discrete variables. This is a generalization of well-packing uh, well of a line for um, analog codes. Okay, so just to contrast with, um, with known codes in the brain, um, uh, you know, here is a conventional code that a lot of people are familiar with. This is like orientation tuning in V1. These are different neurons. Here's the stimulus angle. Um, here's the firing rates of these codes. Um, each neuron is firing some spikes as independent Poisson given those, um, those tuning curves. And so you get some number of spikes for some stimulus um, angle. And then you can then go ahead and decode the variable that is being encoded. And um, it's all worked out. Um, you know, through classic neuroscience literature that the Fisher information of these codes scales like n, the mean squared error then scales like one over n, and the information rate of these codes, which is the log of, um, log of the amount of uh, 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 number of bits used for, for representing the variable versus the, I'm sorry, the log of the information bits versus the, um, uh, the, the number of bits used to encode the variable goes like log n over n, and that itself goes to zero. Zero, okay? So the conventional neuroscience codes have information rates that go to zero, all right? So they have a linear decrease in the squared error, but at the cost of a linear decrease um, in information rate. Okay, and how much better is the grid cell code? Well, the grid cell code, um, if you look at uh, the, the, um, the width of this posterior um, distribution of um, 
the decoded position uh, divided by the width of the posterior distribution for these conventional codes, it's exponentially small in um, n. Okay, so the width is much small, smaller. All right, and so um, and we can and, and so that's that's actually a, a analytical calculation, and then we can also numerically verify that this is true. So in other words, so just to summarize this, um, the grid cell code really enables like exponentially better um, uh, coding accuracy over range. This ratio of coding accuracy over range than the classical population codes that we know from neuroscience from the sensory and motor peripheries, and allows that um, to happen at a finite information rate row. Okay, so, um, so in other words, um, the grid cell code really achieves a performance that's similar to strong error correcting codes in the Shannon sense. All right, so um, we already know that Shannon had proved that you know, before 1948, um, it was believed that it's not possible to have decreases in error um, while having a finite information rate, and what Shannon proved was that it is possible, and his, his um, uh, theorem showed that it's possible to achieve um, asymptotically zero error at a finite information rate for discrete codes, and the corresponding analog statement for that is that you should be able to achieve exponentially vanishing error at asymptotically finite information rate, and that is what the grid cell code um, seems to achieve. Okay, so the interim summary um, here is that the grid cell code really can generate these unique representations for exponentially large ranges of location using linearly many neurons. Um, it's capable of this very metric updating. Um, so the code word for a sum of inputs is the sum of the code words of the two inputs. So that's a, that's a very unique property. Grid cell code is a strong error correcting code. And, um, and I would just like to point out uh, as a sociological note that the discovery of these properties of the grid cell code was very much bottom up from my side, right? This is not, I didn't come in as a coding theorist saying I'm gonna look for um, you know, residue number system codes in, in neuroscience, I'm not gonna look for stronger error correcting codes in neuroscience. It really resulted from this discovery of grid cells and trying to understand why this puzzling representation for space, what are the mathematical properties of it, and a chain of deductive reasoning. So you know, bottom up approaches um, really I think um, have a lot of promise still for neuroscience. I don't believe in the MAR hierarchy completely. You know, software and hardware are completely independent. I think there really is um, a sense in which, you know, neuroscience discoveries are gonna tell us a lot more about um, interesting representations and codes and um, computational abilities in the future. Okay, and um, yeah, all right. And so now, just to the second part then. Okay, so this was a, these were all um, properties uh, that we have discovered about what it is that um, a code in the brain um, is capable of, right? How much information can it encode? It's an encoding uh, analysis, okay? And so, you know, in coding theory, when people study codes, right, you've got some satellite has to encode, um, represent some, uh, transmit some information, so what it does is it's got some information, um, phi that it wants to send, the, it wants to transmit the source, it encodes it as X of phi, um, it goes through some noisy channel, and then the information, uh, corrupted information reaches some decoder, and now the decoder is free to take its own sweet time and decode um, this, this, um, the, the, the transmitted variable, right? So, um, and so what, what we just talked about is Shannon's result, this theoretical capacity bounds um, on strong error correcting codes, those all deal with information that, uh, how much information can be um, encoded and pushed through a noisy channel, assuming the existence of some optimal decoder, right? But those capacity results don't take into account the decoding compl complexity and the decoding cost, okay? But, um, oh, this, this is a duplicate. So, so the, I guess the, the question is that um, in, in the brain, though, we have to understand that uh, the neural representations uh, uh, and, and memory uh, in all of these systems, the encoder, the channel, and the decoder are all built by neurons, right? It's all using the same resources. We have to count, take into account, if, if the decoding involves exponentially many neurons, um, now you've sort of nullified the gains made by the encoding step. Okay, so we have to really try to understand whether it's possible to also do um, uh, decoding of exponentially many states um, or denoising um, using linearly many neurons. And that's kind of a question, the next question. Okay, so that brings me to um, uh, talk about Hopfield networks, okay? And so Hopfield networks, I think, um, don't need too much introduction in this audience. Um, you know, they're defined by these units that are one or zero. Depending on the sum of the inputs that the units receive, they flip their state to be one or zero. Here's the inputs that each unit receives um, to make that decision. And um, the dynamics in a Hopfield, and, oh, and these weights are um, symmetric in a conventional Hopfield network. And um, um, with these dynamics and, and symmetric weights, one can write down an energy function, um, and, uh, which looks like this. And the dynamics of the Hopfield network uh, then are equivalent to descent um, on this energy surface. So for example, if you have a Hopfield network that has some 
uh, some fixed points or some of these low energy states over here and say this low energy state corresponds to some pattern here of neural activation, then if you initialize the system in some um, a version of that state that's a corrupted version of the state, the dynamics of the system um, do descent on this energy surface and bring the system back to that uh, minimum and to that state. Okay, so, um, so uh, because of this uh, sort of uh, dynamics, uh, the Hopfield network can equivalently be thought of as a model of associative memory, but you can also just think about it as a model for correction or completion dynamics or denoising um, in neural systems, okay? And so I'm gonna work within this paradigm um, over here. Okay, so um, I wanna define a notion of robustness. So, uh, uh, you know, so robustness means the ability of the system to correct or recover from some errors, but it means something specific in my case. So um, what I want to say is that um, robustness uh, involves correcting errors in a finite fraction of nodes. So suppose that every node has some probability, fixed probability of error, then the number of errors in a system will scale in proportion to the size of the system. Okay, so robustness means the ability of the system to recover from errors in a finite fraction of all the nodes. All right, and that's my definition of uh, robustness. But for a system to, uh, to satisfy that definition of robustness, it means that the basins of attraction in this dynamical system, in this energy landscape, that the size of these basins must scale up as the network size scales up, okay? So the basins should get bigger as the network gets bigger. All right, so um, let me then bring you to a brief history of the Hopfield capacity results, uh, results on how, uh, what it is that Hopfield networks are capable of in terms of uh, capacity and how many states they can store and decode and what the robustness properties of each of those states is, okay? So um, in, uh, uh, typically, um, many constructions of Hopfield networks uh, have the system storing very few states, but robustly, okay? So um, if you have pairwise weights and random patterns and you can store uh, order n patterns with a small finite error, if you allow the system to have pth order connections rather than just pairwise weights, you can have pth order weights, then the system can um, store order n to the p minus one patterns, but it's extremely densely connected and it only becomes um, exponential when p equals n, which is um, that there are nth order connections in the whole network, so then um, it's sort of not a good situation. Okay, um, on the other hand, it's possible generically in these Hopfield networks to store many, very many states, uh, but then not do it robustly, right? So if you have completely a random network, um, then, uh, oh, so there are constraint satisfaction networks that were constructed by Hopfield and Tank and others. Um, these allow for the construction of e to the square root of n states, and these states are not, um, finite, uh, not robust at all to um, errors. Okay, so, so they can't recover that very narrow basin. Spin glasses, same thing. You can have order e to the n states, but again, they're not robust um, to um, finite fractions of errors. The basins are very narrow. And much more recently, there's some interesting constructions of uh, Hopfield networks that can store e to the square root of uh, n errors. They're partially robust. They can re recover from some number of errors. It's not clear if the errors are um, proportional to the size of the network. And these are networks that are click networks with very specific um, um, uh, configurations of connections within them. And these were actually uh, done by Chris Hillar, who's here um, at the Redwood Institute in Berkeley, and um, his collaborator Tran, and by um, myself and Tran, the same co-author, and some other colleagues. So um, in general, either Hopfield networks have low information rate or are not robust. Okay, so, um, so, so, so that's, the, that's, the st that's the state of um, affairs right now, and the question is, is it possible to have um, exponentially many fixed points, so therefore exponentially decoding of exponentially many states and Hopfield networks um, in a way that uh, is robust to finite fractions of errors in the system. Okay, so how many minutes do I have? Like 10, is that right, I think? I think we started after the introductions at 10 after, so I have 10 minutes. Okay, that's perfect, great, thank you. Um, okay, so, um, so the question is, is this, is this possible? Okay, is it possible to have these Hopfield networks with exponentially many states and robust basins? And um, so, you know, we, so, so since the motivation here is sort of um, the motivation from error correcting codes, right, the motivation from the first half of my talk, we could just say, well, let's take a good uh, uh, error correcting code that we know is good and try to implement it in a Hopfield network directly, okay? So let's just take this famous 7-4 Hamming code, right? It's a good binary error correcting code. Um, so the Hamming code, the 7-4 Hamming code has, you know, four bits that carry information, so you can um, have a binary vector of length four, and that's your sort of your source, it's your data, and each of these um, components is one or zero, okay? And now what you do is you take those four bits that are information carrying and embed it in a code 
code word that's of length seven, okay? And so you've appended onto this four-bit um, code word, uh, this four-bit uh, source, you've appended three additional bits, right? Three redundant bits. And these, these three additional bits are not independent of the coding bits. They um, actually um, satisfy the following properties. So um, you, they're, they're parity checks, right? They, 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 they check, um, they're, they're check sums, if you will. And so um, they, the, 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 the additional bits, five, six, and seven satisfy these three algebraic relationships where the sum mod two is zero for each of these cases. Okay, and so um, here's, here's the code. Um, the optimal decoder, you know, uh, exists. Um, you just recompute the three sums above, you know, given a noisy uh, version of this code word, you just compute all of these three sums and call the first sum alpha, the second sum beta, the third sum gamma, and in fact, that number that you get, alpha, beta, gamma, is actually the index in binary of the incorrect bit. Okay, and so then you just go ahead and flip that bit um, addressed by alpha, beta, gamma, and that will correct the error. Okay, so um, the information rate of this code is um, four over seven because there are four information bits out of seven total used bits, and, um, and, and the capacity of this code actually you can compute uh, from Shannon's uh, theory, and it's uh, four sevenths as well. So this code is really saturating the Shannon capacity, and this code actually corrects all one-bit errors. So any one-bit error in this code word can be corrected according to this algorithm, and it also signals when there's a two-bit error, although it doesn't correct two-bit errors, okay? So the rate in this case equals capacity, and so now to embed this code into a Hopfield network, what we want to do is we want to make these code words, right, the allowed set of states here, um, for these seven bits, we want to make each of these code words um, uh, become stable states of the Hopfield dynamics, okay? That's what we would want to do to embed this in a Hopfield network. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, take our zeros and ones and map them into um, uh, ones and minus ones, okay? And, um, and remember, these are the three constraints, the three extra um, um, sort of uh, parity checks over here. And so what we, we can do is we can construct, a, if we write down an energy function that looks like this, where um, the energy function is uh, given by the product of these, each of these terms is a product of the terms and these sums, okay, and we make all these j's equal to one, this is, you can easily verify that this is an energy function that's minimized um, at, at, at all valid code words, okay? So the, the system has an energy minimum uh, if this is the energy function for, for all valid code words. Okay, so that's nice, right? And so, and because I've written down an energy function, it means I can write down, it's, it's just a Hopfield network, um, and, uh, but it involves these like four point couplings, right? These fourth order coupling terms between all the, um, between all the different um, uh, nodes. So you've got seven nodes here. These are the seven nodes of this, uh, in, in the network. Um, here are the edges, the yellow is like the, uh, I don't know, it's the two, four, yellow is two, J, two, three, four, six, so it's that one. So the yellow is this fourth order connection here. The uh, orange is one, uh, three, four, seven, so it's that connection over there, that fourth order connection, and so on, right? So now I've written down a Hopfield network that has as its minima um, the code words, okay? So that means that if you have a perturbed version of the code word, hopefully the system can correct, um, correct the errors in, in the system, okay? So, so with these weights or energy function, the code words are the minima of the dynamics, and we, have, we, we can obtain two of the four states with seven neurons, okay? So because all possible four coding states are allowed um, as long as those um, checks are, are validated. In fact, um, you know, these fourth order uh, edges seem really exotic, you know, can we even um, write down fourth order edges? Well, it turns out we don't have to write down fourth order edges. You can unpack these fourth order edges into just pairwise weights um, if you allow yourself um, uh, if you allow um, the construction of a bipartite graph, right? So um, hidden nodes in a bipartite graph can induce higher order um, in, um, uh, dependencies. Okay, so are we done? Are we done? Can we go home? We have got now a construction of a, you know, error, stronger correcting code that can then decode um, noisy states. So actually the, no, we're not done. So Hopfield Dynamics cannot properly decode um, the Hamming code. So um, it turns out that, you know, so we've written down this energy surface. So um, this energy function over here, here's a, here's a valid code word, it's the all one's code word, and the energy for this is minus three, you can verify from here. Um, um, now let's just flip one of the bits, let's flip that first bit, and now the energy goes from minus three to, um, uh, to plus one, okay? And so, um, you know, so one way to uh, decode is to flip back that one bit, and um, you know, it, this is in the direction of reduced, reducing energy because you go back to minus three, and this is the correct decoding step. But it turns out that the same energy dynamics also permit the system to wander in a different direction. So uh, if, if you flip now the third bit, um, it actually 
reduce, it reduces the energy because uh, flipping the third bit actually reduces the energy to minus one. So this is a valid direction for the dynamics to flow into. Um, they'll flow, they, they're allowed to flow in this direction or they can flow in this direction. But then if you flow in this direction, then the next downhill step will involve a third flip over here. And um, this results in, again, a very low energy um, state. Another correct code word, but it just so happens that it's an error because it's the wrong code word relative to the corrupted one. Okay, so the picture here, the geometric picture here is that you started at this um, perturbed version. This is the true code word. This was the perturbed version we started with. One, one iteration of the dynamics can bring you in this direction um, in the correct way, but the other iteration downhill also in the energy landscape can bring you to the other minimum. Okay, so in other words, um, you get suboptimal decoding by Hopfield dynamics um, and small perturbations can map to the wrong um, or further away code word. Okay, so um, should we be surprised? Uh, you shouldn't be surprised, okay, because in general, um, strong error correcting codes require very complicated decoding algorithms. They require things like belief propagation, which have a dynamics that's much more complicated than the dynamics of simple summation and nonlinearity at the nodes that, that typical neural networks can do. Okay, so, so um, they re require non-biological um, decoding algorithms. Okay, so, so clearly it's, it's not possible then to implement this Hopfield, uh, uh, Hamming code in Hopfield networks. So the question is, can you do this at all for any kind of strong error correcting code? Okay, so um, I guess I'll just um, tell you the bottom line and then go very quickly just through some features that make this possible and I'll end over there. Okay, so um, the bottom line of, um, uh, of what I'm gonna tell you is that it's actually, it is possible to construct a robust and exponential capacity Hopfield network. So you have exponentially many states with linearly many neurons and the basins of attraction um, scale with network size, okay? So um, the system is robust and the dynamics allow for correct decoding or noise reduction or error correction on them. Okay, so um, this is just the summary of the results of we can construct um, these networks where the number of states versus the size of the network, the note that this is a semi-log plot, it's growing um, exponentially um, with, the, with the size of the network. And moreover, um, if we look at the fraction of correct decoding events um, as a function of the percentage of input that's corrupted, okay, um, you can see that uh, we get basically close to perfect recovery, um, even when just like a finite fraction, in this case about 4% or 6% of the nodes are corrupted. Okay, so this is the bottom line, right? This is what we were going for, and it's possible to do this construction. And so, um, uh, so, so the summary here is it's possible for Hopkins networks to have exponentially many states and correct errors in a finite fraction of all nodes, and so it's possible to have robust exponential memory and decoding. Okay, so then the question is, how does this network work? Okay, and um, I'm not gonna um, be able to spend a lot of time here, but um, the architecture of this network is it's bipartite. Okay, so you've got, um, we've got input nodes, which are the nodes that um, are gonna be uh, learned and um, decoded. Uh, and um, um, it's, uh, in this case, this construction that I showed you is regular, so each input node has um, a, a fixed number of out, outgoing um, edges. It's, it's very sparse in weights, meaning that each node sends uh, a, a, a fixed number of edges, okay, that does not scale with the size of the network. So as n goes to infinity, the number of edges divided by the size of the network goes to zero. Okay, so it's very sparse. The weights themselves have very low dynamic range. They're just binary weights, ones or zeros. Um, this network has an expansion property, so small subsets of input nodes project to maximally large sets of, of these constraint nodes in this hidden layer up here. Um, and um, and um, each constraint node is a small uh, Hopfield subnetwork. Okay, and so the architecture of the system, um, uh, okay, is, 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 this, is this case where I um, talked about uh, this expansion property, okay, so what is an expansion property? Um, here, here is a picture of good expansion versus bad expansion, okay, so let's consider what's bad expansion. Suppose that each input node can send out only three edges, okay, and let's consider the set of these three input nodes. If each node can send out three edges, right, the maximum size of the set that they project out to can be, if they project to completely disjoint sets in the hidden layer, then the, the maximum size of the, the neighbors outside in the hidden layer is nine, right, because they're three times three, so it's nine. Uh, but the minimum size is gonna be just three, because all three of these can project to, suppose they project to the same three. Okay, so then the, the, the minimum size of the neighborhood is three. So ex good expanders are expanders are, are graphs where the size of the neighborhood for a given number of um, outgoing edges is, is close to a maximum, it's large. Okay, and so a good expansion property is one where epsilon is close to zero. 
All right, so that's just the, the formal statement. And so I'm gonna um, skip over some of these um, statements, but um, they, they sort of provide the, the, the guarantees on size, et cetera, that make the system work. Okay, so dynamically, how, does we, how do we implement it? This is all Hopfield uh, dynamics, Hopfield updating. So the inputs are initialized in their noisy, corrupted states, um, and a finite fraction of the states in that have been flipped. Uh, okay, and then now these constraint nodes up here, which are each mini Hopfield networks, um, quickly equilibrate to the, to the inputs that they're receiving. Um, some of these constraint nodes are um, you know, not satisfied because some of the input nodes that um, should have a certain um, sign are actually flipped, and that causes the constraint nodes um, to drive a flipping of the input nodes, and so the rule is that the inputs that are connected to more unsatisfied than satisfied um, input nodes actually um, uh, switch state, uh, constraint nodes um, switch states, and when you iterate this um, over time with just Hopfield dynamics, we're guaranteed, we can prove that you can guarantee that the system will go to minimum energy state and it'll go to the correct state. Okay, and so, um, you know, conceptually what this expansion property of this graph um, allows is it allows uh, solving of the credit assignment problem. So in the Hamming network, the reason why the Hopfield dynamics didn't work is that when there were two errors in the input nodes, the system couldn't really determine which was the, the node in error, okay? And now, because of this expansion property of the graph, um, it's possible for um, this credit assignment problem to be solved, and the dynamics allow for the correct um, flipping of the, of the corrupted nodes. All right, and so um, I'll just mention that we can actually do learning, so we can learn um, input patterns as long as the input patterns of the inputs consist of mixtures of um, um, constrained sparse subsets, um, and we can use contrastive divergence learning and a heterosynaptic competition term, um, which is like a L1 regularizer, and actually learn the structure of the input. So in other words, um, uh, each constraint node will learn and find and connect to all elements of a jointly constrained subset of the input. So if there are small subsets of the input that are in a cluster and should be constrained together, they have relationships to each other, learn, the learning will, will, will learn that. Okay, and so um, I'll just summarize, then I'll say the features are that um, sparse, random, and high dimensional um, structures um, uh, uh, that I've described here, they have low weight complexity, um, and in high dimensions you can deterministically, it's hard to deterministically cons uh, construct expander graphs, but in high dimensions it's very easy to do that. So random graphs um, can be uh, expander graphs, and that holds tantalizing implications for biology. Um, each state is stabilized by a large number of constraints, um, but each of the constraints is very, a weak, very weak constraint on the set of input nodes that it connects to. Um, it also provides some insight into why in um, biology we see these very interesting um, long tail distributions of activation. So the Buzaki lab has these results and many other labs have uh, replicated the results where a few neurons are active all the time and, and, and many neurons are almost active never, okay? So it's really these sparse distributions of, um, of activity, of these long tail sparse activity distributions. They're ubiquitous in neuroscience, but from sort of coding perspective, it's very tough to understand why, right? You would wanna equalize your, your burden that each neuron has. Why is it that you have these long tails? And in this case, um, the constraint nodes are very sparsely active and the input nodes are densely active. And so there's this very natural sense in which most of the nodes are constraint nodes, sparsely active, a few input nodes are densely active all the time and they're being corrected. Okay, so there are a lot of um, questions um, uh, that we have about um, learning rules and, um, um, but uh, I would say that, you know, really inspired by modern low density parity check codes, we can um, construct these uh, objects in high dimensional spaces and um, actually even generalize them. So the low density parity check codes usually have a lot of structure, but um, some of these constructions here, we can relax a lot of the structure that were used in proving theorems, but we still retain the properties. Um, so lots of this work was done, the second half of the work was done by Rishi Chaudhary from my group, postdoc, and the first half was done by Sami Trinivasan, and um, uh, Nock is a collaborator on some of these projects. Thank you very much for your attention. Joe comes to set up. So I, I have a quick one. Well, um, so you mentioned learning at the very end. I think that was more in the Hopfield Net context. So the hippocampus does a lot of one-shot learning where, you know, you encounter some space, you come up with new place cells. Would you predict that the grid cell code, by virtue of being very dense, yeah, I want to use my own would not be a place that you'd see a lot of plasticity um, in the same sort of way? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So, so far we haven't seen evidence. You know, we also have oh. a bunch of data analysis. Oh, so far, 
So far, we haven't seen a lot of evidence for change, so of plasticity in grid cells in the sense that when we look across environments and across experimental conditions, the relationships between pairs of grid cells, like the, the, the activity relationships, whether they're coactive or not, tend to be quite preserved across environments. So it's true that in grid cells, we wouldn't maybe expect to see too much plasticity, and we don't. And um, the question is whether hippocampal representations may be like these expander graphs and these Hopfield networks that can do error correction, and that, that's a great question. That's what we're thinking about lately.